11. To you who wants to strengthen your hara with Zazen. Through Zazen you strengthen your hara. Knowing that this hara isn't worth a damn is real hara and real Zazen. Some people want to strengthen their hara with Zazen so that they will be able to scare bill collector away with a roar. But they don't need Zazen for that. They just have to drink sake like a real man. There are books around like Zen and the art of cultivating your hara. This hara culture is just making it's just uh, about making yourself numb. Some try to become thick skinned through Zazen. Developing real hara means putting aside your personal attitudes. If it's even the slightest bit personalized, it isn't pure unadulterated Zazen. We've got to practice genuine, pure Zazen, without mixing it with gymnastics or Satori or anything. When we bring in our personal ideas, even only a, a little bit, it's no longer the Buddha Dharma. In a word, Buddhism is non-self, Muga. Non-self means that I am not a separate subject. When I am not a separate, sub separate subject, then I fill the entire universe. That I fill the entire universe it's, is what's meant by all things manifest the truth. In the true Dharma there is nothing to gain. In false Dharma there is something to gain. If you practice Zazen when you have when you are already overwhelmed by feelings of pleasure, anger, sorrow and contentment, these feelings will haunt your Zazen like a terrible ghost. Don't bring anything with you into Zazen. Not the Buddha Dharma, not firearms and especially not your wife. The way of Buddha means that there is nothing to seek, nothing to find. If there is something to find, no matter how much we practice, it's good. It's got nothing to do uh, with the Buddha Dharma. If there is nothing to find, that's the Buddha Dharma. Whatever it is you are trying to grasp, even if you get it, sooner or later you will lose it again. True wealth is not grasping for anything. It's shining our light inwards and reflecting, reflecting upon ourselves. When we take a step back, we see that there's nothing to grasp. Nothing to run after and nothing to run away from. The form of reality doesn't arise and doesn't pass. It's neither poor nor impure. It neither increases or decreases. A monk, Yakuzan, is practicing Zazen and his teacher, Master Sekito, asked, asks him, What are you doing there? I'm, doing, I'm not doing anything at all. If you are not doing anything at all, does that mean that you are just passing the time? If I were passing the time, then I would be doing something, but I'm not even doing that. You say you are doing nothing? What is it that you are not doing? Even a thousand wise men couldn't name it. Nothing is as still and noble as this Zazen that even a thousand wise men couldn't name. The Zazen with which Yakuzan practiced and Master Sikido praised. These days there are some masters who you can sit with for a week and for a nice sum of money. You are guaranteed a Kensho experience. It's obvious that anything like that has nothing to do with Yakuzan's Zazen, which even a thousand wise men couldn't name. Sitting and practicing that which even a thousand wise men couldn't call by name means simply sitting, Shikantaza. These days there's a lot of talk about Zazen. The question is simply, what are they trying to do with their Zazen? Some toll away to cultivate their Hara, to become stronger personalities, to get Satori and so on and so forth. The little monks even call Koan training a guessing game. All this is nothing more than Buddha Dharma from the point of view of ordinary people. But the Buddha Dharma isn't a Dharma for ordinary people. We've got to observe the Buddha Dharma with the eyes of the Buddha Dharma. That's why it is so ra rare that Zazen itself truly practices Zazen. Some people want to use Zazen to become better people. Zazen for them, for them is nothing more than makeup. 
this isn't an educational institution here. What we are trying to do is to become a blank slate. Here, there is nothing to gain. Here's a place where you have to let go of all illusion and wisdom. The Buddha Dharma isn't about making average people into special people. So that then takes place when you stop elbow the others to get ahead. You go swimming every morning in cold water. So what? A goldfish does that all the time. You've quit smoking? Yeah, so the cat doesn't smoke either. However proud you are of how well you run after this and run away from that, it's nothing more than wandering around in the world of impermanence. You can talk any anyone, you can't talk anyone into doing that and you can't talk them out of it either. True religion is seeing the world as it is, free of all fabrications. Everything is good as it is. You don't need to fool around with it. Everyone believes they have to do something to their, they have to add something to their Zazen or Nembutsu. You don't need to add anything. However unusual and mystical your experience may be, they won't last your whole life long. Sooner or later they will fade away. Ordinary people really go for miracles and magic. They love hocus pocus. Ordinary people by nature don't like practice. They only want satori. They want to earn money without working. That's why they form lines and lottery windows. And they don't want the true dharma, but they swarm towards a new sex that promises heaven on earth. You get stuck on Satori, you get stuck on money, you get stuck on position and name, you get stuck on sex. Not getting stuck is what's meant by, by the Buddha Dharma. So then there's a major posture, a major attitude, not a childish one. So, to you who wants to strengthen your Hara. So Hara, probably everybody knows it. It's an area around belly area, abdomen area, and uh, hara is uh, is used in martial arts, and uh, it's a it's a gravity center where you can start your movements in martial arts, and also uh, a center of, of human vital energy, uh, especially in, in China and Japan, and their martial arts they have. This kind of yeah, hala, or in China you say dantian, um, as, as an energy center. And this strength in your hara um, just stands for, yeah, you do zazen in order to get something out of it. Uh, but we all know the saying that zen is good for nothing. So, yeah, uh, you want to get something out of it. Sometimes, sometimes, some people want to. Um, yeah, and Kolo Savaki is just uh, criticizing that. That is not the true Buddha Dharma when you want to get something out of uh, out of Zazen. I want to talk here about especially one thing that is. Um, in true dharma, there is nothing to gain. In false dharma, there is something to gain. True dharma, shobo, and nothing to gain is musho toku. And musho toku is uh, quite uh, uh, often is a very like kind of important uh, error. Buddhist Mahayana word.
Mushu Toku means um, yeah, nothing to gain. That is Mu means nothing, nothing, and this uh, this this means uh, like um, yeah, getting a sheep or like profit or benefit, and they together means uh, like earning, earnings. So yeah, we say in Mahayana teaching there is nothing you can get nothing out of it, and the opposite would be. Uh, there is something to gain, and it would be the false stamma. Something to gain would be so there wasn't would be no mood, there would be uh, these other to have. Or you talk. So in Mahayana teaching we have this mood talking. It's a, it's a teaching of of, uh, of of emptiness, of subject and object. There is no one to gain, and there is nothing to be gained. In the Heart Sutra, it's also uh, mentioned. Uh, we find this when, when there is like uh, this um, part where it says like emptiness and emptiness. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, neither old age and death, nor extinction of old age and uh, age and death. No suffering, no cause, no sense, cessation, no path, no knowledge, and no attainment. Mot, motoku. So no attainment would be uh, mo toku. Moshu toku. Yeah. And mo, no attainment is like only like these two. Motoku. It's in a hard sutra. And then with nothing to attain, Mushu toku, a bodhisattva relies on pra prajna paramita and thus. The mind is without hindrance. So we have this also in the in the in the Hanya Shingo. That's what we will uh, chant when we do Takahatsu. Um, and yeah, this is a, the attitude we should, uh, which is an emptiness. And when we do that, then we should have this emptiness, uh, this, 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 this this attitude. Um, even sometimes in the beginning, I mean, you, you, you start the Zen, you have kind of, uh, you want to get this out of the Zen, and you want to, you want to, you want to have that, swings in your hara or something else. That's not true the Zen. The Zen. We have to really to completely uh, let go of whatever we want to have, get out of it. Like last, last time, like Fabian, he was talking about, um, what we do here in Antaiji, we just there is everywhere is pur purpose in our life here. So we we work outside, we chop wood, and we, we we plant our fruit and everything we do, and it's all like this all the surrounding for our center activity here that is which is zazen, uh, which is uh, yeah good for nothing or there is nothing to attain. There is nothing. There is actually no purpose. We just sit. There's no purpose. This mushutoku mind. Mm. Yeah, that's that's really interesting that you have all around these purposes all around in your life, and then here in Antaji is all centered about uh, around this this main practice of just doing it for no, for no reason for yeah with no purpose. Mm. Yeah, usually we uh, we when when we act we usually we, we, we act because we we fulfill a need we yeah we have for example we want to we want to sleep we need we eat we work we talking to socialize or we studying to to learn something new but doing that then is something different. And I think yeah, that's that's why it's also difficult to do um, because usually we are uh, yeah not used to that. Mm. Yeah. Also in my case, I started uh, also the Zen because uh, yeah, I, uh, I had also a need. Like I said, it was very like depressive. Episodes, and then I had a need of just I don't know, doing something else. And when I, I remember when I first said zazen, uh, 
it was just the relief of only I can I can just exist now. Just have, I don't have to do anything. There is don't have to perform or do anything. I just can sit here and experience what's going on right now. I remember I, I was my my window was open. I had the mm, the cars just passing outside the birds and I don't know. It was kind of a release of these everyday kind of kind of struggling around in life. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, but I mean, this was the beginning. Uh, it was how, how how I began to uh, to sit to practice. I mean, when you when you when you practice in uh, like when you practice in a city, in a dojo, for example, and you go there in the evening and in the morning, you still can do it with this kind of uh, a need you have. You just want to have this release. Of course, you can have other. You can do other things that that give you more relief, like relaxation or so. Um, but still, you can have this, mm, like this, this, this attitude, and, and also this, this gaining mind when you when you practice, uh, like only, only in the morning or in the evening when you're in the, in the city, practicing in a dojo, for example. But when you are like, like, like here in Antalji or like in a monastery, and you are always confronted with a lot of sittings. And also this not gaining mind, just completely let go. And then you ask yourself, but, but how? I mean, how should it work? Or why do why do I do it? I mean, always you you have purpose, and now you're just spending so much time with no purpose, just sitting around. Mm. Yes, it's uh, it's different. Also in our in our ordinary life, uh, we have to maybe to learn to mm, to act, to practice with with like with the attitude of not gaining and 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 with the attitude of losing. There's also a saying of Sawaki who says, uh, uh, "Gaining is losing, and uh, losing is uh, enlightenment." Or something like that. So not only in the Zen we try to have this attitude of not gaining and, and we try to like lose whatever is there, whatever kind of uh, imagination, how things have to be, or so we just try to let it go. And also in our, uh, in our ordinary life we also could do it. Um, for example, there is this, this one practice of paramita like dana to give mm, bodhisattva practice to give to give something from you um, and not being like greedy would be the opposite of that so that, that could be a practice of not not gaining something for myself but to give something and uh, also the other what came in my mind what the what Dogen teaches one of the three minds is the, the parental mind where you also just you give you activity for people without expecting anything in return so there also you you, you, you try to to give So that could be could be example for having this moshutoku uh, attitude in, in our ordinary life, not only in, uh, in zazen. Mm. <clears throat> um, yeah, but 
the goal, I mean, we, in our ordinary life, we shouldn't make it so extreme, like, oh, we have to that, give everything, like in Zazen, it's more like, in, we give like more everything, like, we try to give up like everything, like, we die or something. But in our ordinary life, uh, there is a middle way, I mean, Shohaku uh, Humura, he was, he was writing about it, and he said, in our ordinary life, it doesn't mean that we we living a life of self sacrifice just for others. Um, but on the other hand, we don't pursue only our own interests. So there is this kind of okay. You, you sometimes you get something, but you also give something. So this kind of middle way, you don't only give from you when somebody gives you something you also uh, 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 receive it and, not, and you could also say that oh no i don't want to get something please i only want to lose and i don't want to gain so no i don't want to give i don't want to take it that would be also not uh, not very natural so it's it's also about a middle way not 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 extremes in, in, in our ordinary life Yeah, this was um, this were my um, sayings I, I I choose from these three chapters. If you have any questions, please in the comments. Well, maybe only uh, to make it uh, clear, if we all of you understand, already this uh, famous phrase, Zen is good for nothing. And then there's the question, well, then why do we do it? Um, and the answer is simply, well, exactly because it's good for nothing. Because during the rest of the day, we're so busy with doing things that are good for something that it's important to uh, at least for a while get out of that um, how do you call that hamster wheel <coughs> how do you call that yeah. that's an English phrase um, always we we are here and we try to get there um, so now we're in the winter but we're already starting to make plans for the spring and how much fields uh, we're gonna uh, plant so that we have a harvest in the autumn and we're working towards that and if you're living in so-called real life you have to go to school so that you can get a good job and make money and find a girlfriend and drive in a fast car and so on and so on and so on and Sometimes people also practice uh, Zen with that kind of attitude. If I practice now uh, for so many weeks or months or years, where will I get then? Uh, so we're, we're still in this kind of hamster wheel mode. So I do practice so that I get from here to there. Um, or mindfulness. Um, it's like... You're, you're kind of the me wheel and that machine and maybe you start to practice and you get interested in the practice because you feel well I don't turn so well and I need some some grease up or so 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 you practice in the hope that the wheel that you represent gets greased up and you function better and maybe you get promoted to a different spot in the machine where you can turn even faster and even faster and you get even more grease so that you function better and when we say the practice is good for nothing, we mean we stop identifying with that wheel in the machine. We take a break from running in the hamster wheel. And during session we do that for five days. And when you're so used to running in the hamster wheel, it can sometimes be like, like 
what do I do with these five days, this wasted time? Uh, I could do so many other things during that time um, that are actually either good for my career or they could be fun or nothing and, and then you sit there for five days and it's good for nothing. But then it can also be a revelation to see, well, wow, wow, so many things that I forgot because I was so busy in my Amsterdam. And now I'm just sitting there for five days, but yeah, one thing that you might um, then yeah, realize, I've been breathing all the time and I didn't even realize I'm breathing, I'm breathing out, I'm breathing in again. Um, there's sounds that usually I wouldn't see, there's the perception of my body and often there's pain involved in that so it's not necessarily a kind of satisfying experience of sitting five days in front of a wall. But um, there are so many things that you're usually not aware of when you're busy running in your hamster wheel. But then the other question would be next, okay, now I've realized I can get out of that wheel. I do not have to identify with that, well, small wheel that's always turning in the machine, uh, trying to do its job. Uh, and in that moment where I stop identifying myself with the small wheel, I realize I'm actually all of this, the whole experience, everything. Uh, whatever I see, whatever I hear, all the perception, that's me. Um, so Uchiyama Roshi would say, usually we're living in a world of, um, how do you say, comparing ourselves with each other and we represent one human being out of, uh, how many, seven billions? Hmm. About seven billions. Seven billions, uh, probably the number is growing. Um, so we're one out of seven billions. So, so if you think what we represent on this earth, it, it's almost nothing. So in that respect, it's true what Sawaki Roshi always said, that if we wouldn't have been born, nobody would have noticed. Basically, if we would die today, if we had died yesterday, nobody would have noticed us. Only a few people and they wouldn't have really cared about it. Uh, but then, and that's something that can be realized on, on the cushion when you sit, we're also, like Uchiyama Roshi says, that on the one hand we're one out of seven billion, and on the other hand we're all out of all. We're the whole experience. So we're all out of all. In the one sense we're more or less zero, on the other sense we're all out of all, so we're, we're one. We want. Um, and if you make that realization, the next question might be, well, if we do that, why would we seriously worry about the vegetable fields and the rice fields and how much wood do we have and all these things? Uh, when we plant some, we make sure that it's the most efficient way that we do things. Why would we be so worried about the hamster wheel, so to speak, uh, that's always still turning in Antaisha? So we need to get jobs done and we need uh, to worry about the bills we have to pay. Uh, so if on the Zafu we've already realized that everything is one and we kind of there's no need to play that small wheel. It's no, there's no need to play the game that everybody else is so busy about and so worried about. We can also just stop, just stop the game and allow things to be as they are. Um, why, why would we seriously worry about what we have to eat next winter or in the autumn about the harvest? And I think the answer is that, um, for one thing, it's easily to get well trapped in this experience on the Zafu. I'm one with everything and there's no need to do anything from now on, or I don't have to get back into the hamster wheel. 
Yes, but you're also living as one person. Right now we're six here, so you're so one out of six in a Sangha, you're one out of seven billion people on this planet. And although you're one with the whole reality, you also have to live that one person. And that one person has a mouth that wants to be fed. So where does that food get from? Who's going to wipe the ass of that person? If you are not doing it, well, who's going to do it? So um, there's two aspects in, in Zen practice. One is to get on the Zafu, get out of the hamster wheel and just let things be as they are. Uh, like in the Fukanza Zengi, there in Japanese it's Shoen no Ho Shashi, Banji or Kyu Sokushite. In English it would be kind of letting go of all affairs, Banji or Kyu Sokushite. Uh, let the 10,000 things come to rest. So you Forget, even if you're responsible of the hatake, if you're there on the Zafu, you completely forget about the hatake, you completely forget about the rice field. Uh, you forget about what happened yesterday, you don't think about what's going to happen tomorrow, you just let things be. But then the second aspect is you come back from the Zafu and you have to live that person, so you return to the game return to give the game you get return to the uh, machine um, you have to turn that wheel that you represent represent but hopefully um, through sharing this experience on the zafu um, we might be able to play with different rules uh, like for example what um, Dogen Zenji in the Shobogenzo, there's this one chapter, Bodhisattva uh, Shishoho, four ways of bodhisattvas to relate to society. would be one way to, to translate it in the four ways that he exemplifies. First is giving, fuse, giving, uh, words of love. So that can be nice words, but can also be just uh, normal greetings like good morning, good evening. Uh, Itadaki must before you eat, all of, all of these words with which you realize, uh, relate and connect with people, these are words of love. Uh, there's ligyo, which means that you do something for other people rather than only think about yourself. And uh, the last thing is doji, to kind of become one with others, to share life with others. Those are four ways to return to the game play the game again, but according to different rules. Before that, you were only worried about, here, I'm this one, out of six, out of seven billion, I'm one. How can I make sure that I don't end up on the losing side, that I, uh, yeah, maybe if I don't get the best score in the game, at least I want to be somewhere in the top, whatever, first one uh, percent, uh, hopefully, or at least I'll be, try to get into the top 10% or so. Um, I don't want to be part of the losing half and whenever, well, you compare yourselves with others, you become kind of worried because, well, there are so many others who gain more points than you and they have be more beautiful girlfriends than you and they drive faster cars than you and they live in bigger houses than you and, and so ever and so ever. Uh, sometimes even happens, uh, you, you decide to leave home, you become a Buddhist monk, you stand on the street and back, and what do you do? You calculate how much did I do get today, and how was it yesterday? <laughs> uh, maybe there's a beggar on the other side of the street, how much does he get? <laughs> uh, when, you did, when you get above average, you're happy about that, if you get below average, uh, you're sad about that. You know, even then, you're still in this world of comparison. Um, but then on the other hand, for example, we are planning to go begging in March. 
now we've realized that it's not about winning or losing. It's not about what you make or what you don't make. So does this mean that it actually doesn't care if uh, you come back with some money from the begging tour or actually you spend more money on the train and the hotel than you actually get? Well, at the end of the day, we're also living in this world of comparison. So at the end of the day, we have to pay bills. And so, I mean, that's where it sometimes gets kind of complicated, where you have to, you have to live both sides. You have this all out of all, Jiko, as Uchiyama Roshi says, the kind of self that's beyond comparison, but you're also living the self that has to pay the bills. Mm, and you need to do that, but you hopefully try to do that playing to some other rules than the, the normal rules. And the normal rules means whenever you can, how do you say, get an advantage over someone else, you try to get that advantage. Except in the case where you can even get a bigger advantage by pretending that you not really worried about your personal advantage. Like, for example, um, you become a member of the Rotary Club or the Lions Club and you donate to causes that help the community and stuff like that. But you do that in the hope that as a member of the Rotary Club or the Lions Club, you can connect with other influential members of the community and that helps your personal business and your personal status. Uh, and then if you do that, you're still playing by the same rules. That at the end of the day, you want to make the biggest personal gain that's possible. And you only pretend to be worried about the bigger issues because you think that's uh, going to help you personally. So just about this musho toku and usho toku thing. Why do we do a practice that's good for nothing? Well, it's especially because it's good for nothing when we are still trapped in this good for something uh, wheel well we're no different from hamsters hamsters but that doesn't mean that we're not also living as one human being out of whole human being and we are all part or we're all participating in the same game, but we have slightly different ideas about the rules according to which the game should be played. Most people seem to agree that everybody plays only for themselves and who's making the most points wins, but in Boozes we say, well, that's there's no how do you say there's no rule that you have to play that way you can play in a totally different way and can play the game actually any way you want to and can be much more fun if you sometimes change the rules and say well i don't care about how much points i gain you can share these points with me or why don't we uh, forget about personal gain and play together mm and see how things change if not everybody just plays for themselves but uh, we join and play as a team together that's why in buddhism we it's always been said it's important that you have a sangha the buddha says somewhere you should be like the horn of a, of a unicorn always walk by yourself be independent like uh, the horn of a, of a unicorn. On the other hand, also, they say, well, you need at least four people. I think it's traditional. You need at least four people so that you have a Sangha, and the Sangha is one of the three treasures. Mm. So you're completely uh, responsible for your own practice, and nobody can share that. But it's almost impossible to practice all by yourself all year long. 
so traditionally uh, they had kind of three months uh, where you would be people would be more or less solitary by themselves and then people people would come together again and or everybody would travel with the Buddha and uh, listen to his talks again but uh, obviously even in time of the Buddha there were times where he would be separate from the students and just go into seclusion and only have Ananda or a few people uh, with him so it was always this kind of coming and going for one thing everyone was an island for themselves but th there was always the kind of sangha that made this possible it made this possible that you could uh, completely rely on yourself So yeah, uh, basically the point I'm trying to make, there's two sides to practice and it's not always easy to combine these two. One is to completely get out of the hamster wheel and take a step backwards, turn the light, reflect on yourself and see, I'm actually not that hamster that I thought I was. And the other sometimes even more difficult part is to get back into the wheel but yeah do something different than you did before stop running after that carrot maybe run in the opposite direction maybe sometimes don't run at all maybe run but you don't try to win against the other person but say well why don't we run together um, So much from my side. Oh, no. 